We have more people watching us online than we ever dreamed possible. Our online numbers have been six, seven times our, our normal attendance on a weekend. And all churches are experiencing this. There are more people tuning in to listen to sermons and to listen to worship music than ever before. There are more people turning to the Bible and actually purchasing Bibles than there has been in a long time. 55% of Americans are saying they have prayed for this pandemic to be over. People are turning to God. And I know when you turn to God, there's many of you, you grew up in a Christian environment. You grew up uh, going to church, hearing about all these things. If you've lived in, in this area, somebody has invited you to church, but there's so many questions when it comes to God. And especially when we're in something like this, I'll be honest with you. Uh, last week was really tough for me. It was hard. Uh, Easter is one of my favorite times. I love all the activities, all the events. I love the people that come and crowd into the church. And, and, and I love the, the way we do worship and the, and the sermon. Uh, I love seeing my grandchildren, which I haven't been able to see my grandchildren. I love them coming around. And so everything about Easter, <clears throat> even though it was wonderful in a way, was discouraging. And then this week, I'm supposed to actually be walking in the footsteps of Paul through Greece and, and Thessalonica and all of those places. Uh, and I was going to have a group there and we're going to walk in the footsteps of Paul. And I've been so excited about doing this for many, many years. And of course, we can't do that. And so this week has been hard for me. And I know many of you feel that way. Some of you, I mean, you're alone. And if you're not alone, <clears throat> you feel like you're alone. Some of you have lost your jobs and you don't know how you're going to make the payment, and you don't know how you're going to feed your family. Some of you, you've canceled events. You've canceled weddings. Our seniors have lost out on prom and, and graduation, and it seems like every time we turn on the news, something else may be gone, and they're taking something else away, and I heard that they may not play football in the fall, and, and that just sent me into a depression. There's so many things going on. Many of you are juggling trying to work and homeschool your kids. And I know how struggle that may be. Some of you aren't even can't see your kids. And I can't imagine what you're going through. And so when we talk about people turning to God, I wanted to answer some questions. And so a couple weeks ago, we started trying to answer some big questions. And the first question we tried to answer is, what do you think of when you think about God? What comes to your mind when you think about God? What do you think about and the answer to that is what we want you, what Jesus says, the most important thing to think about when you think about God is that you have a heavenly father. You have a father, a good father that loves you, a good father that cares for you, a good father that loved you so much that he sent his son so that you could have life. And so that leads to the second question, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Is Jesus who he said he was? Because if he is, he's the Messiah. He's the Savior. If we can believe the eyewitness accounts, that means that people walked out and saw him walk out of a grave and was alive after he'd been dead for several days. He conquered sin. He conquered death. And he gives us the ability to live eternally with the Heavenly Father. And so today, the big question, if you're following Jesus and you decide, yes, you know, I want to follow Jesus. The big question I want us to ask is, is it worth it? Is it worth it to follow Jesus? Because sometimes you're talking to God, you're asking God questions, but there's nothing coming back. You're not hearing from him. You have all of these questions and you're seeking answers, but God seems to be silent. You're asking God to show himself to you, but you're hearing nothing back. And, and many of you, you've just given up because you're like, I, I just can't hear God. I, I don't get it. I, I, I'm not experiencing it. And I just give up. And so the question we want to answer, is it worth following Jesus? Now, as far as questions, those early followers had a lot of questions. I mean, they had listened to Jesus teach, but they did not understand what he was teaching. When he died, they thought the movement was over. They were miserable. They were running for their life. They were scared. And then Jesus appeared to them, and then he spent some time with them, but he didn't answer all their questions. In fact, they thought 
that he was going to return any day. And as the years went by, they had questions. They called out to God. They wondered what was going on until they started dying one by one. And Jesus hadn't come back. So we've always had questions. Now, the problem is sometimes the answers to these questions. And as I look at Facebook and other social media, as I listen to some people talk about God, there's a lot of lame answers out there. There's a lot of lame answers, and lame answers lead to a lame faith. And so I want us to be careful in who we listen to and, and who we get our information from. I mean, even in this pandemic, you'll find people who are doomsday and everybody's going to die to other people who think it's a conspiracy. You have to be careful where you get your answers to these questions because wrong answers will lead you to a wrong faith. Wrong answers lead you to a wrong faith. Incorrect answers lead you to a weak faith. And I think we see a lot of Christians living out this life without the right answers, and they have this weak faith. And so when they're crying out to God, and they're trying to get God to answer, and they don't feel like he's listening, or they don't feel like he's answering, sometimes you just walk away. Sometimes you answer that question, is it worth it on your own? And you come up with the answer, no, it's not. Let me tell you, following Jesus cost something. And so it's a good question. In fact, Jesus said we were to count the cost and to decide because it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you friends if you follow Jesus. It's going to cost you relationships. Sometimes in your work, your businesses, it's going to be harder if you're a follower because maybe you could get ahead by doing some unethical things. And if you're a follower, you're called to live by higher standard. You're called to live by different morals. And, and so some, it makes it hard. So if you are this follower, it costs you something. Now, the problem is we don't see the cost because we've developed this consumer mentality when it comes to Christianity. We have this consumer Christianity, and that means they believe that God is there and God exists for them. And God is like a cafeteria. In other words, you, you look at God and you want to be religious and you want to be spiritual. And so we are all spiritual and so we're seeking God, but we want to define God in our own terms. And so we have the word of God that gives us his commandments. We have preachers preaching the word of God, explaining how we're to live our life and how our life is going to be different, but we treat it like a cafeteria. We look at it and go, well, I don't believe that or I don't believe that. I'll take some of that love and grace, but I don't want any of that judgment. I'm just going to pick and choose what I believe. Consumers, if you're going to follow Jesus, he says, you're going to obey my commandments. You're going to follow me all in wholeheartedly. You got to give it all to me. You can't just look at part of it and say, well, I'm going to accept this, but I'm not going to accept that. I hear people making the lamest excuses and answers for why they're not living consistent with the word of God. Now, the church has played into that So, The church has played into it. I mean, we're here. We have two beautiful campuses we have beautiful buildings. You come, you get fancy coffee, you get donuts, you have a play place that is over the top for your children. You have beautiful facilities. You come in, there's lights, there's smoke, there's incredible music, there's adequate preaching. We have all these things that people look to and they consume. And, and some of you are doing that very thing when you look online. You're looking for the best product. But something that this pandemic has done has showed us a lot. Because it's stripped away all that. All that's gone. It's been stripped away. And today, if you tune in, like I said, people are tuning in more than ever because they want to hear a word from God. They want to learn. They're doing Bible studies. They're growing in their faith. They're following Jesus. And we have to watch every thing we can to help them understand. There's some great answers. Is it worth it? It is unpopular to follow Jesus. In consumer Christianity, it doesn't matter. But if you're truly a follower, it's unpopular. It's difficult to follow Jesus. It's risky. And it's very inconvenient. Now, what I've seen since that's all been stripped away is you're still coming. You're joining us online. And the most incredible thing 
that I'm witnessing in this church is you're consistently giving. I truly thought that'd be the first thing that fell apart is giving because in consumer mindset, we give to get something. But right now, you're giving and you're not getting anything in return. You're not getting the environment. You're not getting the show. You're not getting the children's ministry. You're not getting any of that. But you continue to give, and you're literally helping your neighbor through the most difficult time when there's fear in your own life, when there's problems in your own life, when you're watching, and while other people are hoarding, you're giving freely. That's incredible. You're serving others, even though it's costly, inconvenient, and uncomfortable. Is following Jesus worth it? There was a time in Jesus' ministry that the crowds were following him. And they were following him for the same reasons a lot of people attend church. They were following Jesus for what he could give them. And he was doing incredible things. He was feeding people. He was healing people. He was doing miracles. He was doing all these things. And this crowd began to follow him. And they saw him as the Messiah. And everybody wanted a piece of that. And everybody wanted to hear his teachings because he taught with such great authority. And as he got to the peak of his popularity... He preached a message, and in that message, he said something very strange. He said, if you want to be my follower, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now, let's be honest. That sounds strange. And as he started telling people that these things were going to happen, and the Messiah was not going to be what they expected, that he was going to suffer and he was going to die. The crowds begin to leave him. It says at that moment, the crowds turned away because the teaching was too hard. And that's what Christianity has to offer. You have to understand that it is complicated. It is difficult. It is not easy. It is risky to follow Jesus. And then we have to go back to the question, is it worth it? So as all these people started walking away, Jesus looked at the apostles, the disciples, those that had given up everything to follow him. And he said to them, he goes, are you going to leave too? And I love the answer. Where would we go? You have the words of life. And at that point, he began to teach them. And I want to read a passage out of Matthew. It says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed on the third day, be raised to life. Now, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him and said, Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns concerns. Following Jesus takes us to a point that we stop thinking about our own needs. We stop thinking about our own wants. We stop thinking about our own desires. We set our minds on godly things. We set our minds on the things above. And so we stop fighting for our rights. We stop fighting for our sin and defending our sin. We simply give over to God and say, God, I don't know how to do this, but you do. He looked at Peter and said, get behind me. You're not thinking the correct way. With consumer Christianity, we're not thinking the right way. We don't come to church for what we can get. We come to church to give. We go out in our community to give. We love people to give so we can teach them and show them it's worth it. This is what Jesus says. He says to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. So listen, he's looking at his followers and saying, if you want to save your life, you have to give it up. You have to lose your life to save it. You've got to jump in. You've got to give it all you've got. It's kind of like kids when they're learning to swim. There are basically three types of kids you see at the pool. There's a kid that's standing on the side and he's not getting in the water. He is not going to get in. He is screaming. He is hollering. He is defiant. He thinks the water is fire. He's not going to touch it. His parents are pleading with him and he's not getting in the water. And then you've got the kid who'll sit on the edge and put his feet in the water. But that's about it. 
He's not going to get in. He's going to stay where it's safe. He's going to sit on the side. He's going to put his feet in the water. And then you've got the kid that just jumps in completely. Now, who learns to swim first? That kid that jumps in. In Christianity, there are people that stand and they look at it and they're like, I don't want anything to do with it. I don't want anything to do with it. I'm staying away from it. I don't want it. But a majority of people who attend church are sitting on the side of the pool with their feet in it. They're not fully in. They're not fully committed. They're just consuming and, and they want a taste of it, but they don't want to experience the whole thing. And so Jesus is explaining, listen, listen, if you want life, you have to lose it to gain it. If you want life, you have to turn over your desires. You have to give up your wants. You have to give up what thinks going to make you happy. That way, you don't look at the Bible as a cafeteria. Whatever it says, you know it's for the best. And so if something conflicts with what you want in your life or you think you need in your life, you give it up to God and you say, God, you got to take care of this. You, I trust you. I'm jumping in. Is it worth it? I think it's worth it. There are people watching. You know it's worth it. You are trading your dirty, sinful life. You're trading your hard heart for something incredible. You're changing your destiny, your eternity. You have this eternal life in Jesus, and it is incredible. He gives us purpose. So that's eternity. What about now? Right now, this is what he promises. He says, if we jump in completely, no excuses, no picking and choosing what you believe. If we jump in and give him our lives, he says, I will be in you love and joy. I'll be peace in your life. I'll give you patience. I'll give you kindness, goodness, faithfulness. I'll give you gentleness and self-control. That is is incredible. You mean I can trade my anger for love? I can trade my anxiety for peace? I can trade my evil behavior for goodness? I can trade, I can trade my lack of self-control for discipline? I'm all in. Instead of selfishness and hoarding, we get to serve and love our neighbors? And you'll notice something. In those that have jumped in, all in. There's a peace. There's a joy. And we want to serve others. And I'm seeing that all through our community. And it is so exciting to watch. I love what we are doing this month in supporting all of these ministries in the medical area. It's incredible. While other churches are, are, are hoarding and afraid, you are reaching out and stepping out in faith. And we are just doing everything we can to bless others during this time so they can see it's worth it. It's worth it. This pandemic has caused more people to turn to God than anything else has in my lifetime. More people are reading the Bible. More people are tuning in online. We need to be ready with an answer. The church needs to take up that cross and follow and set the example. We need to live out what giving up our lives to save it looks like. What good is it? What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Who is God? Who is God? He's our Father. Who is Jesus? He's the Messiah that conquered sin and death and gives us eternal life. Is it worth it? You better believe it. So I want to encourage you, those that are standing on the side, angry and obstinate, jump in. Those that have the feet in the water and you've been there for 15 years, jump in. Those of you that are consuming church and consuming Christianity and picking and choosing what you're going to believe and how you're going to live, give that up. Lose your life. What does it matter if you win the whole world but lose your soul? What can you give in exchange? I invite you today to jump in. Jump in. The water is fine. Let me pray for you. Father God, as we continue 
to focus on you. God, there are times that we can't hear you. There are times that we're afraid. There are times that we're depressed. But God, you're in and over all, and we know that you are there, and we have more. God, thank you. Help us to continue to look outside ourselves, to serve, to love, to be an example of what it means to lose our life so that we will actually find it in you. Thank you for that abundant life, that joyful life, that peaceful life, that life filled with love and patience and goodness and faithfulness and all of those incredible things that you give us in exchange. Father, we thank you. We pray that you'll bless all of these homes tuned in and that they'll see each other in a different light and they'll encourage each other to jump in and be all in. Father, we can't wait to see each other again. Keep us safe until then. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I want to invite you in the next few weeks, I'm starting a series on how to survive this shelter in place without divorcing or killing one of your children. We're going to spend the next two to three weeks talking about some things that can help you in your marriage, in your parenting. It's going to be an incredible time together. We don't want you to miss it. Of course, check out all the resources we have online for you. We have everything you need to lead your family through this time and to lead them spiritually. We believe that we're going to come out of this stronger and better than ever, and we're not going to have room in either of the new campuses that we have to fit all the people that are ready to jump in in their faith. Thank you.